I did a second video on our ecosystem relationships uh, series. In this one, we're going to be focusing mostly on population ecology. The first one was more on general ecology, levels of organization, biotic versus abiotic factors. On this one, we're going to be looking at those factors, specifically at the level of populations, to talk about how competition for resources can limit the growth of populations. All right. So life would grow exponentially like this if given the chance. Because if each organism can duplicate, all right, and have, let's say, just two children, then over time, uh, two become four, four become eight, eight, 16, and 32, and then 64. And before you know it, there's millions and millions of organisms. <clears throat> but organisms can only grow like that under certain conditions. They can only do that if there's very low competition and a lot of resources. And by the way, that basically is what we're going to talk about over the next two videos. The first one is going to be focusing on competition, and the next one, on other types of uh, limiting factors. Now, because of that, populations will grow fast, very fast, and then slow down. Now, actually, at first it goes really slowly because there's not a lot of mates around and it's hard to kind of get it going. But as soon as you get enough critical mass, then it will explode and go fast. But then as they do approach what is called the carrying capacity, you end up with what is called logistic growth because there are limiting factors. That reduces the rate at which organisms can actually support themselves until you get to a maximal number that can be supported by an ecosystem, and that is called the carrying capacity. Any population that exceeds that number will immediately crash below it and then, uh, and then try to approach it again and then crash below it, creating a zigzag that tends to follow uh, that pattern of flattening near the carrying capacity. And that happens because in real life, there isn't low competition in, in limited resources. Under certain conditions, at first, it might look like that, but ultimately, it always ends up curving down and slowing down. Now, the carrying capacity depends on a lot of biotic and abiotic factors, but it's basically the maximum number of organisms that the population can reach an ecosystem without crashing back down if it goes above it. Now, the limiting factor we're going to be talking in this video is this idea of competition. The idea that organisms must compete among themselves and even the, between species too. So it happens at the community level, but we'll talk more about that in the last video. But even within one species, they will compete for mates, right? They will compete not to be eaten by the predator. Uh, trees will compete for sunlight and try to reach the canopy as much as, as fast as possible. Uh, uh, zebras and wildebeest all compete for one tiny water hole in Africa. So because this means that even if there's a lot of resources, literally, if there's a ton of resources, Due to the competition alone, right, there's going to be a loss in productivity in the amount of people that can grow. So you can have a lot of mates available, but because you have to compete for them, you end up spending a bunch of energy, which means it's less energy that you spend on, on actually other things that will lead to reproduction. Now, uh, one way to look at the fact that competition has an ecosystem is by looking at what happens when an invasive species enters the ecosystem. So an invasive species is one that does not belong to the ecosystem being introduced to it. Like um, lionfish were introduced to the Caribbean, uh, and they completely are eradicating a lot of species on that area uh, because they because of what I'm going to talk about in a second. A lot of plants are often introduced. People think it's cool to bring an awesome plant to an area that is not a native to it. And all of a sudden, you realize pollen and seeds and fruits are spreading the plant everywhere, and they're all competing to natural plants. Uh, the same happens with amphibians, with, with, with uh, insects, ants carried down by boats, uh, end up all over the earth and then actually damaging lots of ecosystems. Uh, you have pests traveling from continent to continent, carry them inside of, of, of human vessels. So a lot of the time, it's humans that do this. It could happen naturally, but most of the time, they're transplanted by human actions, whether it's on purpose or not. Whether it's I bought a pad and I don't want to take care of it anymore and I release it to the wild. And then it meets another pad that also got released to the wild. And all of a sudden, it's it's multiplying like crazy in the ecosystem. Or if it's because I purposely try to kill something by bringing in a species. But that 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 was going to remedy the problem. But now it brought another invasive species that causes another problem. And there's lots of examples of things like that. Uh, animals hitchhiking in planes and in um, cars and trucks and trains and boats as the world became a global thing and we travel around back and forth we are constantly carrying species from one place to the other and that includes viruses and bacteria by the way which is why so many emerging diseases travel across the world now why invasive species tend to take advantage of ecosystems they enter 
That's because they usually don't have any natural predators. The predators that live there, they look at that and like, what is that? I don't know what that is. I'm not going to eat it. And so because they don't have natural predators, they grow out without limits, without being hunted. Uh, they also sometimes tend to have features which could outcompete the native species. Now, that's not always true, but when it is true, it will cause the species which are there to be uh, to be displaced because they get outcompeted. And they also can sometimes introduce diseases. Like, for example, when humans came uh, from Europe to North, North America, uh, there were a lot of uh, diseases like smallpox, the plague, that were introduced to Native Americans. They didn't have resistance to it, and they all ended up dying. Likewise, when you bring a new type of plant or a new type of or animal into an ecosystem, it could be carrying a disease that others in that ecosystem do not have resistance to, and so end up killing a ton of organisms. So the result is that when you introduce an invasive species, that one will tend to grow a lot, while others uh, that compete with will crash. So that's the typical graph. You will see one increasing exponentially while the other one is crashing and nearly becoming extinct, which is sadly what happens because of this. So humans try really hard to fight invasive species um, from uh, having hunts against them uh, to introducing another species that can maybe destroy it and trying to do so carefully that to not uh, uh, to introduce a natural predator, but without causing another set of problems. So it's really hard to do remediation, what's called bioremediation, after you introduce a species. Uh, Right now, there's thousands of populations of, of pollinators going extinct because of ants that are, are being introduced to North America. And the, the stories don't never end. You know, uh, snakes released in the Everglades and uh, crocodiles that are not supposed to be there uh, that are from Egypt and et cetera. It's like um, wherever you go, there's a story of some invasive species and plants uh, or animals which are destroying the ecosystem. So this usually causes a complete destabilization of the ecosystem and harm for other species. And it's a great way to show the effect that competition alone can have, complete destruction of a, of a species, right? So competition is a serious limiting factor. And on the next video, we're going to talk about other limiting factors that also matter and regulate how populations grow. I'll see you guys.